Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It is my first visit uh, to Marple Sixth Form College. Uh, I am Professor Peter Gaunt, Professor of Early Modern History at the University of Chester. And I've been there since the dawn of time, it thinks. Um, what I'm also is President of the Cromwell Association. I am, as I always do on these occasions, wearing my Cromwell tie with his motto, with the um, not very PC uh, motto, Peace Through War. I am a parliamentarian. I always warn my, I teach this as a final year special subject to my undergraduates, and I always warn them right at the start, uh, are you going to get an unbiased view? Question the historian. Don't accept what the historian tells you. Is the historian trying to hoodwink you? Uh, find out about the historian. So, this is my interpretation of aspects of allegiance. I've only been given 30 minutes or so. I can't cover everything, but aspects of allegiance in the Civil War. And the first slide is a map of the country, England and Wales, divided up under royalist and parliamentarian control by the end of the winter of 1642-3. So we're a few months into the Civil War. By the end of the winter, early spring 1643, the country had been divided up. Thus, uh, the parliamentarian areas in godly lime green, the royalist areas in bastard blue. I am a parliamentarian. Um, so more or less 50-50 as divided up. That map is a lie. There's truth there, but there's also fiction. The whole area under parliamentarian control is shaded in the same shade of green, and it shouldn't be, because some areas by the end of the winter were more firmly parliamentarian than others. Ditto, the royalists area, I put it in a uniform shade of blue. Some areas were clearly by this stage more fervently royalist than others. And equally, there's a fairly crisp division uh, where the blue meets the green, and again, that's probably a lie, it shouldn't be. There are areas on the frontiers between royalist and parliamentarian control where there wasn't a clear demarcating line. There's sort of a contested area, a debatable lands around the fringes of the blue and the green. So there's elements that are wrong with this map, but there's, in broad terms, that's how the country had been divided up in the first few months of the Civil War. But that map is certainly not a map of popular allegiance, what the people wanted. You cannot say that in the green areas, the ordinary people, the mass of the people, were fervently parliamentarian. There were plenty of royalists marooned in what had become parliamentarian territory, and vice versa. There were pro-parliamentarians who found themselves marooned in uh, the blue areas, royalist control. That is a map of military control by the end of the winter 42-3, it isn't a map of popular allegiance, as we'll see, anything but. How do we get to that form of a split? Well, the old idea was that a few great men, a few grandees at the peak of society, had sort of dragged whole regions into the king's camp or the royalist camp. And that works in some areas. Uh, the two gentlemen on the left, Henry the first Marquess of Worcester and below him his son who became the second Marquess but at the time of the Civil War was generally known as Lord Herbert. They were very rich, they were very powerful, they owned huge amounts of land in South East Wales. They were pro-Catholic, the first Marquess was a Catholic. They fervently supported the King. If we want to see why South East Wales went fervently into the Royalist camp very early in the war, the role of those two grandees probably does play a part. Ditto in parts of the north. The, the top in the centre is, um, well, the Earl, later Marquis, he ended up Duke of Newcastle. Uh, it is William Cavendish, Duke of Newcastle. A big territorial ma magnet in the north of England. He had lots of land and power in the north of England. The fact that much of the north went royalist quite early in the war may have been due in part to the Earl, Marquis, Duke of Newcastle's influence in the north of England. And the two gentlemen on the right contested Warwickshire in the West Midlands early in the war. Uh, this chap here is the Earl um, of Northampton, and he was pro-royalist. 
And the chap on the right has named is Lord Brook. He was a parliamentarian. So two peers who had interests in Warwickshire and they contested. And the way that Warwickshire was divided, part of it going to the king, part of it going to parliament in the opening months of the war, can be explained in part by the influence of those two figures. So the idea of great men, huge aristocrats, big figures, determining the allegiance of certain home patches, areas where they had land, where they had lots of servants and employees and had influence. There is some truth there, and it works in some places, but not in others. Far from it. There are plenty of examples of great grandees finding themselves out of kilter with the popular opinion in their home area. On the left, the chap on the left is the Marquis of Hertford. He was a royalist. He had lots of land and territory in Wiltshire and in Somerset. In the opening weeks of the Civil War, he tried to call out Somerset, his home county, to rally to the king. He tried to raise troops for the king in Somerset. It didn't work. He met with popular resistance in Wells and Shepton Mallet and elsewhere, and he effectively had to run away with his tail between his legs. The fact that he was a great magnet and had land in Somerset didn't work. He wasn't able to call out the county of Somerset in southwest England in support of the king. The dashing chap in the middle with the uh, fancy ruff is George Bridges, who was Baron Chandos. Baron Chandos was based at a castle, Sudley Castle, in Gloucestershire. He too was a royalist. And he tried to call out Gloucestershire for the king. It didn't work. He called into Cirencester in Gloucestershire. He was treated very badly by the people of Cirencester, who didn't want to support the king early in the Civil War. He had to run away. He had to run away so fast he left his coach behind. And the people of Cirencester in Gloucestershire expressed their views about his royalism by smashing his coach to pieces. He'd got away, they couldn't lynch him, but they smashed uh, Lord Chandos' coach to pieces. And the chap on the right is the Marquis of Winchester, the fifth Marquis of Winchester, and he was based at Basing House in Hampshire. Now, he turns Basing House into, he's a royalist, and he turns Basing House into a big royalist garrison that survives until very late in the war, but he wasn't able to call out the people of Hampshire his home county in general, to support the king's cause as he did. In fact, most of Hampshire was parliamentarian for most of the war. So the idea that a few great noblemen, a few great aristocrats, could determine the allegiance of huge swathes of England and Wales works in just a few cases, but if anything, they're the exception, not the norm. There's plenty of evidence, historians now say, that... The great men approach really just doesn't work. It doesn't explain how allegiances were formed and how the map I showed earlier um, came about. And indeed, recently, a whole swathe of historians, uh, including many that, including myself, uh, and many that I'll talk about shortly in the rest of this presentation, have stressed the ordinary people whether they were living in towns or countryside, whether they were living close to London or in far-flung counties, down in Cornwall, up in the north of England, even over in Wales, and if time permits, I'll say a bit more about Wales later. Even in far-flung counties, ordinary people were informed about what was going on. In early Stuart England, ordinary people, both in towns and countryside, some of them were literate, they could read, and adult male literacy rates were quite high at the time, surprisingly high. Historians have tended to put the figure upwards over the last generation or so. But even if they couldn't read, they could gather in ale houses and hear from their slightly better educated literate colleagues, could read a pamphlet or could read a handwritten newsletter to them to inform them about what was going on in London. And there were lots of ballads being issued in the early Stuart period. Little picture 
showing an event, and then a, a sort of a verse with music to it. And so there's lots of ballads, and ballads, some of them could be knockabout stuff, all sorts of humour, um, smutty stories and all the rest of it, but some of them were political and religious. They related to what was going on at central government in London. So historians say a few great men, a few great aristocrats couldn't influence wide allegiance because ordinary people in towns and countryside, they, in the early Stuart period, increasingly knew what was going on in London and in central government. They were informed about what was going on with King and Parliament. They're informed about what was going on with the Archbishop of Canterbury and Church of England policy, and they had their own views on it. So the great men theory really doesn't hold anymore. And instead, what we see time and again on the eve of war and as war breaks out are fairly informed opinions being expressed in petitions. Some of those petitions survive in manuscript form. Others found their way into print quite quickly. And here from Cheshire, uh, which is the county in which I work, a couple of petitions from 1641, 1642. So around the time the Civil War was breaking out. And we can get an idea of wider opinion. It's mediated by whoever drew up the petition. But we can get an idea further down the social scale about what people, in this case in Cheshire, but there are lots and lots of county petitions, what they were thinking through what they're saying in these petitions. And what they say typically is, we don't want this war. We're not royalists, we're not parliamentarians. We think this is a dreadful, unnatural war. This war is going to tear the country apart. Please, King, please, Parliament, get together settle this in co by a compromise settlement. Um, it's a sacred truth that a kingdom divided cannot stand. We don't want this civil war. This civil war is dreadful. It's unnatural. We're not going to become parliamentarians. We're not going to become royalists. We want peace. We want a compromise settlement. And time and again, I've chosen Cheshire examples, but from a whole string of English counties, just a few Welsh counties, we get expressions coming out in 1642, just as the Civil War is beginning, a plague on both your houses, we want peace. And some of them go further, some of these petitions go further, and they say, um, we're going to keep the Civil War out of our county. Leading men in Cheshire get together and they actually draw up a neutrality treaty. We're not going to support either side, we're going to be neutral in the Civil War. And roughly 20 counties in England and Wales in the opening months of the war drew up neutrality treaties. We're not going to be royalist. We're not going to be parliamentarian. Cheshire declares effectively its independence of the war. We're going to keep out of the war. Yorkshire did the same. Staffordshire did the same. Devon did the same. Cornwall did the same. A whole string of English counties middling to elite members of the county get together and they draw up neutrality pacts or treaties. Now clearly, by the end of the first winter of the war, those neutrality tracts and the feeling of neutralism had been crushed because King and Parliament had got control of and had carved up the country in this way. How do they do it? Well, time and again what happens is a member, a, a political figure, manages to raise troops, often outside the county, and then returns to that county at the head of a newly raised body of outside troops. On Parliament side, generally raised in and around London. On the King's side, generally raised in and around Oxford, which had become his HQ. And they return with those outside foreign troops and they mount swift campaigns and they overwhelm the civilians within Cheshire and Staffordshire and Yorkshire and so on, and they compel those counties to sign up for King or Parliament. So we see a whole series of figures who play that role. On the top row from left to right, it is Sir William Brereton, who was a parliamentarian. He raised troops in London, 
he returned to his native county of Cheshire, and in a swift campaign in the opening weeks of 1643, he compelled most of Cheshire to come out for Parliament. Next, at a very early engraving of Oliver Cromwell. Doesn't look much like his later portraits, but that is Ollie in the 1640s. He raised troops in London. He returned to his native area of Cambridgeshire and Huntingdonshire, and he forced that area out of neutrality. The next one, Sir John Gell or Gell, whether you prefer a hard or a soft G. He did the same for Derbyshire, for Parliament. He raised troops in London. He returned to his native county of Derbyshire. He overwhelmed neutrality in Derbyshire. He forced Derbyshire to sign up for the war. And top right, that is John Hutchinson, uh, who did the same in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. They're all parliamentarians on the top row, and then in glowing colour on the bottom row, on the left, looming out of the darkness with the red sashes, Sir Ralph Hopton, who raised troops in Oxford and returned to his native county of Cornwall to force Cornwall to reject neutrality and to enter the war. And on the right, again with a very fancy collar, um, that is Henry Hastings, who raised troops in Oxford and returned to his native Leicestershire and forced Leicestershire into the war. So what we've got time and again... Figures raise troops elsewhere in the opening months of the war. They return to their native county and they use those troops to mount a swift campaign to overwhelm local neutrality and antipathy to the war and they force those counties to sign up for king or parliament. None of those are titled aristocrats. At the time they did that, Early in the war, none of them held peerages. Hopton and Hastings were rewarded by the king later in the war. They were raised to the peerage. But in this opening months of the war, when they forced their localities into the war, they were commoners. They did not have titles. And the top row, at best their knights, Sir John Gell or Gell. These are not leading figures. They're not members of the super rich. They're not territorial aristocrats. Oliver Cromwell didn't have a... He, had, he was a member of the gentry, but he was minor gentry. Sir William Brereton, his estates were only worth probably three, four, five hundred pounds a year. That's quite low on the gentry scale. These people are landowners, but they're minor landowners. They're not the gentry who play that role. So, this map doesn't reflect true popular allegiance, it reflects enforced allegiance, the way that time and again counties were forced out of neutrality and forced to sign up for king on parliament. It also in part reflects the HQs established by the two sides by the end of the winter. Parliament had established its HQ in London, it had a huge resource of troops in London, and that really compelled the area around London to be parliamentary. We know that Kent, down here in the far southeast, Kent had lots of royalists. Lots of people in Kent supported the king, but Kent is shown in green because it's right on the doorstep of Parliament's main army. The royalist of Kent either had to scuttle away or keep their heads down. Kent is so close to a huge parliamentarian army its parliamentarian throughout the war, despite the strength of royalism at grassroots level in Kent. And similarly, Oxford becomes the king's HQ, but in the opening weeks of the war, the people of Oxford express sympathy for Parliament. It's only the arrival of the king with a field army he'd raised elsewhere that forces Oxford and then Oxfordshire to become firmly royalist, as it did for the rest of the war. So, the presence of the two rival HQs and big armies also explains part of that map, how England and Wales were carved up by spring 1643. But historians say in any case, that sort of map, or map of that ilk, it disguises, it hides more than it reveals. They say the attitude of the leading members of society don't tell us everything. What historians in the last generation have wanted to do is dig further down the social scale. 
to try and find out what ordinary people at grassroots level, non-elite, ordinary people living in towns and countryside thought and what their allegiance was. And one who was a prominent figure there was uh, the late David Underdown. And David Underdown, in a series of books, but in particular, his fabulous Revel, Riot and Rebellion. David Underdown's Revel, Riot and Rebellion, he looked at the western counties of Somerset, Dorset and Wiltshire. And he came up with the idea of an ecology of allegiance. David Underdown's ecology of allegiance thesis. And what he said was, if we look at those southwestern counties, we could see different patterns of farming and occupation. In some parts of those counties, there were large parishes and the population was very dispersed. Large parishes, a dispersed population, very fluid and open parishes, people moving in and out, receptive to new ideas. Godliness or Puritanism had taken hold in those sort of parishes. And those sort of parishes were particularly prevalent in a farming region that he typified as wood pasture, areas where the grazing of cattle was the main farming approach. Conversely, in other areas of those southwestern counties, he said, we see areas where there are much smaller, more enclosed parishes. Smaller parishes and the people come together and they're living in a village or a small town. So a nucleated settlement. Those parishes are much more strongly under the control of a local landowner, and of the local minister. And they're much less open to radical ideas. They're more conservative. They're more backward-looking. They're more traditionalist. And those areas are particularly associated with areas of downland and arable farming, the growing of crops. So wood pasture regions, large parishes, dispersed population open to new ideas, open to radical religious and political ideas. And where are we moving this? When civil war breaks out, they tend to be parliamentarian in allegiance. The other areas, arable and downland areas, growing of crops, small parishes, nucleated settlement, conservatism, tighter control, and they're more... They're less open to new ideas. They tend to rally to the king and become royalist in the Civil War. And so uh, he divides it up. Um, on the left is Wiltshire. On the right is Dorset. And he thinks, in terms of popular allegiance, what the ordinary people in those two counties thought, he thinks that on the basis of the parish arrangement and of main farming practices, they can be divided up into areas, and he's put them in hatches, the shaded area, the chalk downland areas that tended to be conservative royalist, and the unshaded areas, wood pasture areas, they're more radical, they're open to new ideas. In 1642, they become parliamentarian. So on the basis of the local units of government on the basis of farming practices, Underdown says you can trace an ecology of allegiance. You can see areas before the Civil War that are open and radical, new ideas are there, and they become parliamentarian in terms of what the ordinary people, popular views thought. There are other areas, much more enclosed, paternalistic, less open to new ideas, conservative with a small c, and they become royalist when civil war breaks out. Anne Hughes, who I believe has spoken here on a previous occasion, Anne Hughes on the left, she focuses on Warwickshire. 
that is the county of Warwickshire, and she broadly supported David Underdown's ideas. She said the northern part of Warwickshire, which is unshaded, was mainly wood pasture in its outlook, and it conforms to the Underdown pattern, wood pasture, large parishes, open, radical, it becomes mainly parliamentarian in the time of the Civil War. The southern part, that she's called Fielden or Felden, that conforms to Underdown's arable and downland area, and that, when Civil War broke out, was predominantly royalist. So, in her work on Warwickshire, Anne Hughes broadly conformed to the Underdown ecology of allegiance thesis. And if we look at Cheshire, this is Cheshire, not my home county, but where I've lived for quite a few years. If we just look at the size of parishes, the Underdown thesis sort of works. Most of central and eastern Cheshire, where parishes are quite large, became parliamentarian early in the Civil War and remained parliamentarian. The western part and also the southern part, close to Shropshire, where there are typically smaller, denser parishes, that area far more fervently royalist, and indeed the west of the county, the Dee Valley, remained royalist until very late in the Civil War, when it had to be conquered by Sir William Brereton. So in some areas, the underdown ecology of allegiance, size and pattern of parishes, farming units, cease to work. But Mark Stoyle, in his key book, Loyalty and Locality, Mark Stoyle looked at Devon. And in Devon, he said, hmm, that doesn't really work. He divided the county of Devon, as the maps indicate, into four main sections. You've got East Devon, South Devon, North Devon, and then Mid Devon. And he divided it into four main areas. And his conclusion, looking at popular allegiance, South and North Devon were mainly parliamentarian. Mid Devon was mainly royalist. East Devon was divided. So the South and North of the county mainly parliamentarian. The middle bit, mainly royalist, the eastern section, divided. And he said, OK, why? Why is that there? Is it an ecology of allegiance? He said, he tested Underdown's thesis. Is it predicated upon different parish sizes and farming practices in Devon? And he said, no. And he looked at almost any of those four regions into which he divided Devon, he said that the underdown pattern that had worked a bit further to the east in Somerset and Wiltshire and Dorset just doesn't work in Devon. It doesn't hold true. So he rejects underdown's ecology of allegiance thesis on the basis of his work in Devon. Is it to do with the leadership of the landowners? Now, there weren't many resident peers, members of the House of Lords in Devon, but he looks at the next rung down, the big gentry, the leading gentry landowners, the knights and the baronets and people. And he looks at them, and by and large, the leading landowners of Devon were pro-royalist. They supported the king. But in most of Devon, they're not able to carry the ordinary people with them. In the south of Devon, the southern bit of Devon, that's where it's the richest agricultural land, that's where many of these leading gentry lived, and they were royalist in their outlook. But in terms of popular allegiance, South Devon was overwhelmingly parliamentarian. So again, like most modern historians, Stoyle said, it's not the lead taken by the super rich, the big landowners, that determine popular allegiance, what ordinary people thought in Devon. And so Stoyle looks at a range of different topics, and he says there are a number of ways that we can explain this allegiance. 
he looks at some occupations and he looks, Devon was a cloth making county and he looks at cloth workers and he says cloth workers tend to be fairly literate because they're in business and they're generally not, they don't have an employer, they're self-employed, they're individual businessmen, they're individual entrepreneurs. The cloth workers, they're not yet organised into factories or anything like that, we're well before that period. They're individual entrepreneurs, they're literate, they have to deal with a certain amount of paperwork. They're independently minded, they negotiate their own terms, they're quite well informed. And he says, perhaps because of all those features, the cloth workers at Devon were far more likely to be parliamentarian than royalist. Devon has a long coastline, divided, a north coast and a south coast. Lots of ports, lots of mariners and people who earn their living at sea. And again, Stoyle says, if we look at the mariners and the ports and those who earn their living fishing, trading, and at sea, overwhelmingly they supported Parliament, not the King. Why? Because they're moving around the country, they have links with other ports elsewhere, they're picking up radical ideas from other ports, he suggests. So ports and mariners and seamen were more likely to be radical and in Devon. That swung them in the north, near the north coast, and south, near the south coast, into Parliament's camp. The only area that was strongly royalist was the central area, which is effectively Dartmoor, mid-Devon, landlocked mid-Devon. That's more royalist. And Stoll says there are two reasons for that. Lots of people in mid-Devon, in the Dartmoor area, earned their living from tin working. They were tins. And the king had strongly support, before the Civil War broke out, the king had supported the rights of the tin workers against local landowners and against their neighbours. He promoted tin working and he'd given legal protection to the tin workers on and around Dartmoor. And they repaid that support from the king by broadly supporting him when Civil War broke out. And the second key feature and for Stoyle, it's probably the main determinant of popular allegiance in Devon, is religion. Radical religious views permeate the coastal areas in the early Stuart period. By 1642, there's lots of radical religious ideas, not only in the ports, but moving inland in North Devon and South Devon, and in parts of East Devon too. But those radical religious ideas don't make it to mid-Devon. Mid-Devon, far more conservative and backward-looking in their religious outlook. So whereas those areas that, by 1642, the ordinary people tended towards a godly outlook, whether or not we use the word Puritan, which is a loaded term, but their godly outlook, they then sympathised with Parliament when civil war. In the middle of Devon, landlocked mid-Devon, in 1642, they're far more conservative and backward-looking in religion. They're not Catholics, they're Protestants. But they conform to and are happy with Charles I's high church Laudian religious policies. And so they're much more likely to support the king. In terms of Wales, with an eye on the time, I will whip through Wales... Wales is unusual. Wales, most of Wales, was fervently royalist from the outbreak of the war. There's no real antipathy or neutralism in Wales. Most of the Principality of Wales, surprisingly early, surprisingly strongly in the Civil War, came out to support the King. Indeed, it was soon nicknamed the Nursery of the King's Infantry. And why? Why does Wales come out so fervently? in support of the king. Well, um, we can, again, there are published petitions in the name of many counties and regions in Wales from the opening stage of the war. And we can see what was worrying the Welsh. What complaints did the Welsh have in 1642? 
from the petitions a number of things. Wales had gone Protestant, but the Reformation had reached Wales late and quite weakly. So again, a bit like mid-Devon, a bit like the Dartmoor area of Devon, the Welsh conservative in religion, they were worried about all the Puritan godly ideas coming out of Parliament. They stressed that they feared religious change, they wanted a traditional church. A second complaint, many parts of Wales, particularly mid and north Wales, the economy was based on a cattle trade. They bred and raised cattle in the hills of Wales, but then they took them across the border to English market towns on the border, Chester and Oswestry, Shrewsbury and Hereford, to trade them. And they were worried that the growing division between king and parliament would block that trade. They were worried about the Welsh cattle trade. And the third fear that they had, Wales and the people of Wales were very aware that they were close to Ireland. They had a long coastline that was vulnerable. They were aware in 1641 the Irish Catholics had risen up in rebellion and had gained control of most of the island of Ireland, and they feared that they would be next, that the Irish Catholics would make the fairly short sea crossing across the Irish Sea and would invade Wales and slaughter Welsh Protestants, just as they had slaughtered English Protestants in Ireland. And the king responds to that. He sees those demands, and in a series of speeches that he makes when he visits northeast Wales, early in the war, and he sends his son, the future Charles II, into South Wales to spread the same message. What Charles says is, I recognise the Welsh fears. I recognise Welsh individualism. I know Wales and the Welsh, you're a good people. You're a wonderful people. I respect you. Help me win this war, and I'll do right by Wales. I will guarantee the traditional church continues. I will save you from Puritanism and heresy. Support me and give me victory in England, and I will then protect Wales against the Irish Catholics as well. And I will do whatever is in my power to stimulate our, uh, Welsh trade and to protect the Welsh Catholics. And that works a treat. In almost the whole of Wales, he meets a strong response and Wales rises up very, very strongly in support of the king. And Parliament has a hard time to break that Welsh royalism. It's not until 1644 that a, he was a Welshman, Sir Thomas Middleton, who was appointed Parliament's Commander-in-Chief in North Wales, he doesn't have the forces to conquer Wales, but what Middleton does, he starts issuing propaganda. You've been misled by the king. He's not going to help you. Parliament, we will help you. We will protect the traditional Welsh church. We will protect the, and restore the Welsh cattle trade. We will protect the Welsh coast from Irish attack. Oh, and by the way, we'll also lower your taxes as a special treat to Wales. Taxes in Wales will be lowered if you desert the king and come round and support Parliament. And indeed, 1645 to 6, that's by and large what the Welsh do. Having been won over by the king and his young son at the start of the war, in the closing stages of the war, Welsh allegiance switches. Most of Wales moves from the King's camp to Parliament's camp, not because Parliament launches a major military campaign in Wales. Very little fighting, hardly any battles in Wales. It's to do with the Welsh becoming disenchanted with the King's cause, feeling unhappy with his early promises. They haven't been fulfilled. And instead, they begin to buy Middleton and Parliament's promises. So Welsh allegiance changes from one side to the other because first the king and then later in the war parliament via people like Middleton tune in to what the Welsh are thinking and they hit them with propaganda trying to sell 
the royalist cause or the parliamentarian cause to the Welsh, and it works. So far I've talked by and large about allegiance in general. How about individual allegiance? Well, with an eye on the time, this really won't take very long because the depressing story is that very, very few people who were involved in the Civil War, who supported one side or the other, have left us reliable evidence about why they supported one side or the other. Now, I emphasise their reliable evidence. What do I mean by reliable evidence? Mm. It's no good looking at what participants said later on. Assuming they survived the war, in the 1650s or 1660s, they wrote their memoirs or they wrote their autobiography. They may then, 10, 20 years later, have reflected back on what led them to support King or Parliament in 1642. But generally that's written from hindsight and with an eye on what happened, how the Civil War unfolded and what resulted from the Civil War. So those slightly later accounts, mm, historians generally say you need to treat those with lots of caution. If we're looking at strictly contemporary accounts, evidence that we know combatants or participants actually wrote in 1642-3, to strictly contemporary with their decision, with the outbreak of war, why they supported one side or the other. Oh, it's a desperately thin picture. Maybe a few dozen, but not much more than that. We've got, for example, the Vernies. We know um, the Vernies, we know why they supported one side or the other. Um, on the left, Sir Edmund Verney, he actually didn't like the king and the king's policies very much. He was critical of Charles I. He was critical of Charles I's religious policies, but nonetheless, Verney said, I've got such an overriding loyalty to the king that I will support him, even though I've actually got doubts about Charles I and his policies. And he actually wrote in one of his letters, mm, but it's a poor cause, I almost welcome death. And indeed, he did die at the first battle. Battle of Edge Hill in October 1642. His son on the right, uh, Sir Ralph Verney, his son and uh, heir on the right, Sir Ralph Verney, initially became a parliamentarian. He was an MP. He supported Parliament early in the war. And he supported Parliament because he said he thought the king had encroached on the rights and liberties of the people. But a bit like his father, he was half-hearted. He was a half-hearted parliamentarian. When Parliament unleashed some of its religious reforms in 1643, that was too much for him. He deserted London and went into exile on the continent. But we've got very, very few clear statements from people like that about why they supported one side or the other. Generally, what do they say? Individual allegiance from a small number, a few dozen. The royalists stress loyalty to the crown a desire to protect the traditional church and religion. Loyalty to the crown, a desire to protect the traditional church and religion against innovation and heresy. Those who became parliamentarian, they tend to stress the rights of the people and represented in parliament and that the rights of the people and true religion should be protected. Both sides claim to be fighting in support of the true faith and true religion. Isn't religion a wonderful thing? God was on both sides in the Civil War. We have a few others. This is Sir Ralph Salisbury. He was from North Wales, Sir Ralph Salisbury. He was a major landowner in Denbyshire in North Wales, and he became the leading parliamentarian in Denbyshire early in the war. He actually died in 1643, and this is probably a posthumous portrait. That's why his wife and kids are looking a bit sad. Daddy's gone. His, so, so Thomas Salisbury has left us a wonderful letter. And I have printed off copies, so why not? In true, here's one I prepared earlier. If you grab one and pass it round, we won't discuss it now, we're running out of time, but if you look at what he said, he contemplates the war, 
He says, initially I wasn't sure which site he supported in 1642. But he then said, I didn't discuss it with friends. Friends would lead me one way or the other, that's no good. I shut myself away from friends. I didn't want to discuss it with them. I wanted to get my own mind clear and decide what I wanted to do. And he decided to become a royalist. He supported the king. On what basis? Well, assuming it gets to you in due course, I'll have a few more if we run out. Um, what he says is, he read the Bible. He looked at various Old and New Testament. So he looked at the Bible and biblical texts. He looked at history. He looked at earlier risings in Europe. How when other states of Europe, the Germanic lands, had risen up against the Holy Roman Emperor in the 16th century. He looked at how that had ended very badly with decades, if not a whole century, of internal turmoil, heresy, a breakdown in order, near anarchy. When a nation rises up against its God-given ruler, all sorts of unpleasant things follow. Sir Thomas Salisbury concluded. And so Salisbury decided in the end to support the king and he became a fervent parliamentarian. He died quite early in the war, probably of natural causes rather than any bad, a fervent royalist. And he died early in the war, probably of natural causes rather than fighting for the king in battle. But the problem is we've only got a few dozen of those sort of people and hardly any letters like Sir Thomas Salisbury's that you now have in front of you. So to get an idea of why individuals supported King or Parliament in 1642-3. We have to go down the social scale, but hardly any people from lower down the social scale have left reliable contemporary documentation. Two London-based parliamentarians have, on the left, uh, a woodcut that may be a chap called Nehemiah Wharton, who was um, servant to an apprentice or servant or apprentice to a London-based painter. He became a parliamentarian. He joined up in the parliamentarian army. He became a sergeant in the parliamentarian army very early in the war. And he's left a string of letters from his involvement in the Edge Hill campaign. And on the right, well, we haven't got an image of him, but uh, on the right, I've cheated and I've used Paul Seaver's, uh, the front cover of Paul Seaver's book, who looked at the surviving writings of Nehemiah Wallington, who was a London-based woodturner. And he became, he didn't fight, he didn't join up, but he became a civilian supporter of Parliament in London. So two sort of lower middle class, a London apprentice and a London artisan, a woodturner. They both left letters or journals that make it clear why they supported the parliamentary course. And in both cases, it's religion. They had taken on board strong, fervent, godly religious ideas. The sort of religious ideas that are often called Puritan by historians. And it's fairly clear, they don't write a simple statement, I support Parliament because... We look for that in vain. But Nehemiah Wharton and Nehemiah Wallington, if we look at their written accounts that they wrote in 1642, it's fairly clear, and it's safe to conclude, that it's their religious fervour, it's their godliness, it's their religious radicalism that impelled them to support, in one case by joining the army, in the other case by paying taxes and through his prayers, supporting the parliamentarian. But the problem is, once we've got a few dozen members of the elite, we can trace what they said in 1642 to 3. We've got a handful of people below the elite, although they have to be at least literate to have left accounts, as these two Nehemiahs, Wharton and Wallington, were. But for the vast majority, 99% plus of people who joined up and fought in the King's Army or the Parliamentarian Army in 1642 to 3, for the vast majority of the populace at large, they have left no reliable evidence that can tell us, tell us as historians what impelled them to move from neutralism to active willing parliamentarianism or active willing royalism in the opening stages of the war. Allegiance 
remains one of the dark corners of the land. In large areas and in a large part, it remains a territory for intelligent historical guesswork rather than chapter and verse from the surviving contemporary documents. Thank you very much.